The royal blue sometimes is used to symbol the royalty. The pink candle shows the joy of the coming of Christ, and the white candle shows the birth and purity. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have you guys get together. Ron, Mitch, get your hands on it, and you're going to light this first pur pur purple candle. Here, dude, it takes a minute. There it goes. All right. Thank you. Now we're going to have a little prayer real quick. First Sunday of Advent. It's a purple candle with the theme of hope. The first candle represents hope. So let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come give us your protection so we may be rescued from the dangers that beset us because of our sins and be a redeemer to deliver us who lives and reigns with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming to light my first candle. Thank you. So the first thing we're going to see, and if you guys want to, we're going to be in Isaiah 7. Now, understand, these things we're going to talk about now, these things happened over 500 years before the coming of Christ. God did not try to surprise us with Christ's coming. Matter of fact, the Jewish nation has been looking for Christ forever since this time they knew the messiah you could go to any jewish child and start talking to them about the messiah and they could read you the scriptures they knew the messiah was coming but they were looking for a different type of messiah you see they were under the oppression of the roman iron boot was on israel they wanted a savior to save them from rome they wanted a savior to come in as a warlord and to take over the nation and restore the kingdom of David and Solomon. That's what they were looking for. And they searched the scriptures and they looked to see how it was going to happen. There was no surprise to the Israeli nation about the Messiah. There was just misunderstanding. Isaiah 7, 10 through 14. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Isaiah, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, ask either in the depths or in the heights above. But Isaiah said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said again, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? 
But will you weary ye my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name and shall be called his name Emmanuel. So this was not a surprise. They knew the Lord was coming. They knew Emmanuel was there. And the word means Savior, by the way. The coming forth of the King. This is a prophecy that was long known. Was long held. Isaiah 9, 6 and 8. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. You, can you see where the misunderstanding comes in here? When they hear things like, and the government shall be on his shoulders, they're thinking of a king that's going to come in and govern the world again, with the lead being Israel. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Mighty God, the ever Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. They were looking for the wrong type of God. They were looking for the wrong type of Savior. But at least they were looking. Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever. You see, he is giving a picture of the coming. We can relate this. You know, we have an advantage. We have this thing called the Bible that's complete and full, the whole prophecy. We live in a time after Jesus has come, died, and been resurrected. These people didn't have this advantage. They had a love of God, and they had a need, and they were in hard shape. So they were reaching, and searching, and hoping, and praying. You know, that's what we're supposed to do, is hope and pray. Our hope and pray is different from what their hope and pray was. They were hoping for a prayer of, of a military leader. We are hoping and praying for our future, our salvation, when we are with God again. So it's two different things that were happening here. And all they had the benefit of were the scriptures and the prophets of the Torah. So they only had a partial picture of what was going to happen. They didn't have the full picture. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord sent a word to Jacob and hath lighted upon Israel. Israel understood they're the chosen people. God chose them. God brought them out of Egypt, gave them the land, put them there. But you see, even though they were given everything they were promised in the beginning, what did they do? They didn't follow God. A lot is said about the Babylonian exile where they were taken out of Israel and they were put into Babylon. But you know what that was? It was a purification. Because up to that time, the kings after Solomon, including Solomon for partial part of his life, started serving other gods. The gods of the Amorites, the gods of the Babylonians, the gods of the Assyrians. They said that Israel was filled with temples to all these different gods that were pulling them away from the one true God. What did the Babylonian exile do? It focused Israel's attention back on who God was. You see, it's easy for us as Christians, when things are good, to let our focus drift off of God. And to get concerned about things like work 
and cars and bills and even grandchildren to the point that we take our focus off of who God is and serving God. None of those things are really bad, by the way, but none of those things should outweigh your love and your service to God. That's what had happened with the Israelis. So he took them and he put them in Babylon. He put them under hard, cruel punishment of a severe Lord. And they stayed there for all those years. And he only brought a small portion of them back to Israel to rebuild the country. But those that came back were focused on God. They knew what could happen now if they didn't follow God. If they got off into all these other things and lost their focus on who God was. So when they came back, they became a nation focused on God. A nation focused on the hope of the future. Of a future to where Israel was the chosen nation again. Where God protected and loved and gave them all that they had before. That's where their focus was. I love this picture. It's a stump. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, but you can take an old stump out in the woods and all of a sudden, a sprig of a new tree will grow out of that old stump. That's what happened to Israel. That sprig, if it's left alone in the forest, not only will grow, but as the stump rots away, that tree will take over that old stump and become a new tree all on its own. You see, God had to fix Israel. He had to refocus Israel. He had to take the huge tree that Israel had become with all of its glory, and He had to break it down. And in doing so, he set it up for new growth. You know, sometimes God has to do that. He has to tear something down for new growth. We see that right now. Historical buildings have been there hundreds of years. They have all the significance to people in our major cities. They're going in there and they're knocking them down to build these new, beautiful, great, big steel skyscrapers. And all that old history... And everybody moans over the loss of these, these structures. But in a lot of cases, those structures were rotten. They were old, they were weak, they were crumbling. They needed to be renewed. And that's what God does sometimes. He tears down the old so that He can make the new. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And there will and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counseling and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. You see, pointing towards Christ and who and what he was, even though God had destroyed a good portion of Israel, the line of the kings remained. Here's, a, here's an interesting thing. You see, Jesus didn't just come up through Mary. came up through Joseph. Well, wait a minute. Joseph and Mary did not have Jesus. Jesus was born of a virgin. So how does that work? Royalty, folks. If you've ever understood anything about royalty, royalty has to marry royalty for it to be a holy child. That's the way the system worked. So not only did Joseph have to be from the line of the kings, Mary was of the line of the kings, and when they married, that made theirs a holy or a royal union. Isn't it funny how God could bring them up through hundreds of years like this? and keep the lines pure all the way to them. An ensign, an ensign, a banner, an object, 
Something that denotes something great or important is an ensign. We say as Christians that Christ is our ensign. Some people, like I have under here, wear a cross. Just to remind me, it's against my flesh, I feel it. Matter of fact, every now and then, uh, I'll bump against something and I'll stick me, okay? Just kind of that reminder, hey, I'm, st I'm right here, okay? But we have this ensign, this thing that we look at. You know something? We never got to see Jesus in this lifetime. Jesus says we're blessed above others. Why? Because we believed in Him without seeing Him. We were able to reach beyond what we talked about in Sunday school this morning. We're very visual people. Okay? Okay? When we see something, we make judgments about that just by seeing. I told a story in Sunday school this morning about a, a, a man. He rides up on his Harley Davidson in front of our church. And he gets off his bike and he's got all the chains and everything and the, and the leather jacket and everything else. And everybody was kind of shunning him and like, what is this guy doing? And he came right into the church. Folks, he was the evangelist for the day. He came in and gave a wonderful message. But people judged him before he ever walked in the door when they heard that Harley in the parking lot. People have a bad habit of doing that. That, for us, is something we need to keep in mind. Is who and what it is that's our inside. Isaiah 11.10 and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which will stand for the ensign for the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. You see, he was looking forward to us all the way 500 years before Christ came, he was already looking to us. Oh, folks, by the way, we beat the Gentiles. Yeah, that's us. Unless, you're, unless you were born Jewish, of a Jewish you know, nation, you're, you're the Gentile. But God was looking towards us. And he was saying that we would be the ones that would look towards Jesus. Isn't it funny today? Now, I'm not taking anything away from our Messianic Jewish brothers who believe in Jesus Christ. But there are not only the Jewish nation, but other nations who do not accept Jesus Christ. Isn't it funny that it was the Gentiles, the outcasts, the Samaritans first, who nobody wanted to have anything to do with it, who embraced Jesus, who accepted Jesus, who started the churches. God cared about us even back then. What's our hope? Our hope is the coming of Jesus. Whether you live a long life into your old age, until you lay into a bed of some nursing home, until the minute you close your eyes the last time and wake up in the arms of Jesus, or you hear the trumpet blast and you leave this world in this body and you meet Him in the sky, Either way, our future is sealed for all Christians. Christ is waiting for us. Amen. We don't have to wait for Him. He's right there. I told somebody the other day, I don't fear dying. I know where I'm going. I know what I have waiting for me. I can't wait to get there. I only fear the act of death. That thing we all have to go through. I fear the act of how will I die? That's the only fear that humans have. The thing we look forward to. But after that moment of sorrow, instantly we will be face to face with Jesus to start our eternity. Hope. We have a hope that non-Christians can't even understand. Even if they had the Bible in front of them and they read the words, they can't understand it. Why? 
Without the Holy Spirit's touch, they can't believe. The Holy Spirit has to get ready for them and come to them and touch their hearts and open it up so the Scripture hits them and when it hits them, they accept it. And that acceptance that they have gives them the eternal life. That's the hope we have. That's the hope that we want to desire for everybody that's not a Christian. As they come to that knowledge, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Especially in this precious time when we celebrate our Savior's birth. It reminds us of why we're here. The beautiful Christmas tree in the back of the room and the candles burning. Without Jesus has no meaning. It's just stuff. These are to focus us. Like God had to focus the Israelites. He needs to focus us. And once a year he gives us an opportunity to remember. It's 365 days. You say we should remember all year long. We're humans. We drift. Okay. We can't keep our focus. You know, things happen. It gets busy. I get it. I'm there. I'm with you. I'm a teacher. My focus gets off. I get worried about other things. Sometimes we just need to be reminded. And this is a precious time that we get to refocus on who and what Jesus is. Matthew 24:30. And then there shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of earth mourn. Why will they mourn? Because then they'll understand it's true. And they missed it. It's true and they rejected it. It's true and like it's happened to me when I've tried to speak to somebody about Jesus. Oh, I don't want to hear about all that stuff. Yeah, somebody's told me about that before. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. But they won't be able to, des to deny it because they'll be right there in their face. We're visual people. Once they see it, you know what they'll be? They'll be sorry. Sorry and repentance are two different things. And then shall all the tribes of earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming, in the clouds of glory, with power and great glory. You see, when Jesus came last time, He came as a suffering servant. He came to give His life for you and me. He came to be that lowly person who did not question, did not argue, did not fight against, that allowed humans to abuse and kill Him. But when He comes back next time, folks, that's not my Savior. He will be in heaven coming with a flaming sword and in all His glory and splendor and majesty. That's my Jesus. That's somebody I can't wait to see. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Folks, we have so much to be thankful for. Why? Because we are Christians. If there's anybody out there, I don't care if you're on the internet, if you're seeing this, and there's a doubt in your mind, now is the time for you to come to a knowledge of Jesus. Now's the time for you to search the scriptures, ask the questions, find somebody to get the message from. Because once a year we get refocused, and now's that time. Romans 14, 11, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. There's not going to be anybody left out. Saved or unsaved. For the saved in Christ, we will be at the judgment seat of Christ. And He's going to look over our lives. 
And He's going to look at all the good that we've done in our lives. And that's going to be precious as silver and gold. And He's going to look at all the evil that we've done in our lives. And it's going to be burnt up, thank goodness. And we're going to be rewarded. But for those that don't know Jesus Christ, folks, there is a place called hell. They can, they can spin it and twist it and try to put things on it and call it whatever they want to call it and say, oh no, earth is hell. No, there is a place called hell. And for those who reject Jesus Christ, it's waiting for them on the other side. They will go to judgment. Their lives will be looked at. And they may have been good people. But if they die in their sins without confessing to Jesus Christ and asking for forgiveness, then that will be the place that they will spend their eternity. And I am not ashamed to say that. There are pastors right now in this nation when you ask them those questions, they'll say, well, you've got to understand what well, there's the beginning of a lie. There's truth and there's lie. And the truth is, Christians have an eternity waiting for them that's full of splendor and glory. And those that reject Jesus Christ have a future waiting for them. That is full of separation from God. We want you to be part of the family. We want you to come to Jesus Christ. That's the word this church needs to get outside of this building. Father, thank you so much for this Christmas season. Thank you for the lighting of the first candle. Get us on that road and get us our thoughts refocused on back on what is important. And that's you. And that's what Jesus did. That's what's important. And that's what we need to be about. So Father, reach out to anybody in this Christmas season. Let something that's out there touch their hearts. Let something that's out there make them question their lives and question how they've lived and understand that all sin has to be paid for. But there's someone who's paid for it for them. Father, for this church, this is a time for us to show the Christmas spirit and to show the love of Christianity to others. Whether it's the gift that we're buying for an orphan or the food that we take to somebody that doesn't have enough, it's through these things we show the love of God. Through the church first, and then for those who need to hear about God, who need to hear about you. So Father, be with us in this time. And as we turn to family time, if there's something going on in your life and you're having a hard time, and you need to just come up here and kneel at the altar and pray, it's open to you. If you need to speak to me, I'll put my little mask on and we'll talk after the service. If you just need to talk to your Father who's sitting there listening right now to you, Now's that time. So whatever your need is, spend time with God in this moment. In Jesus Christ's name. I want to thank you for joining us. Whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, for just coming and being part of our service on this first Sunday of Advent. I hope you got a blessing from it. And thank you for being here with us at Frontenac Baptist Church in Cocoa, Florida.